Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today is episode 62, and I'll be discussing fungal hydration and fungal nutrition, or basically how fungi get the nutrients they need to stay alive and grow. This is going to be a really interesting episode, because unlike plants and unlike animals, the fungi have a relatively diverse range of methods to acquire nutrients. The plants will typically absorb nutrients right out of the soil, which get carried through their vascular systems to the places where growth is actively occurring, like meristems, leaves, and the vascular cambium that generates secondary growth. The animals get their nutrients from consuming other organisms, be they plants or other animals, and these consumed organisms get dissolved into their base nutrients as the consuming animal digests its food within a series of internal organs, like stomachs and intestines. Now, the fungi have a variety of mechanisms that various species use to acquire nutrients. Some fungi are parasitic. Some engage in symbiotic relationships with plants or algae, or even animals. And many more of them are saprotrophic, or saprophytic, which is a really cool way of digesting food that I'll I'll explore in more detail in just a bit. So first things first, I want to start by discussing fungal hydration. Relative to almost every other aspect of fungal physiology and their life strategies, fungal hydration is probably the simplest and most straightforward. In general, the hyphae of the mycelium have a huge surface area relative to their volume and this makes them incredibly absorptive of water and free nutrients that exist in the soil. When these hyphae grow through the soil, they'll simply absorb water on contact through diffusion, and the water will be integrated into the cytoplasm that flows through this hyphal network. In this way, water absorption and fungal hydration is relatively straightforward and simple. This absorptive quality is what makes fungi as much as 90% water by mass. But there's a downside. Because of their extremely high surface area, and because of their extremely high water content, water also evaporates out of the fungus at a relatively high rate. This is an example of how having a a really high surface area to volume ratio can be a double-edged sword. You can absorb things really, really easily, but those same things can also evaporate from you or diffuse out of you relatively easily. This trait confines fungi to humid areas, either in the shade, in the soil, or in an organism, away from excessive light and heat that would otherwise be lethally dehydrating. However, fungal hydration, you know, it is simple, but it's not as simple as just diffusion and evaporation. Sometimes, the fungi will create specialized hyphal structures that are optimized for water absorption or water transport, and in that sense, they're much more like the roots of vascular plants. These structures are called mycelial cords, or rhizomorphs, which is translated literally to root form. These rhizomorphs have structural qualities that mimic the vascular tissue of plants and allows them to transport water and nutrients across relatively large distances, across distances that diffusion alone cannot cover. This compensates for the fact that diffusion alone can only move water a relatively short distance, and so diffusion by itself is unable to keep a large fungus totally hydrated. These mycelial cords are composed of bundles of hyphae running parallel, creating a thick rope of hyphae filaments. This is why the mycelial cords look relatively large, like a plant's roots, whereas individual hyphae are typically microscopically thin. The hyphae on the inside of the rhizomorphs are typically wider, called vessel hyphae, and these are surrounded by a coating of smaller, narrower, sheathing hyphae. Together, the vessel and sheathing hyphae create a relatively conductive corridor that can carry water and nutrients across a very large distance, and thus, feed a fungus that has its hyphae spread across a wide area. This provides a valuable evolutionary function to the fungi, as it allows them to situate themselves on a primary food source 
and then support the growth and expansion necessary to explore the local habitat for more food sources. As the mycelial wavefront expands and grows farther and farther away from the primary food source, these rhizomorphs can support continual growth by piping in water and nutrients from as much as 9 meters away, or about 30 feet. In fungi that parasitize a host, the rhizomorphs allow the fungi to spread throughout the body to infect new areas. So it's basically the same thing, just on a smaller scale. Instead of spreading through a forest, you're spreading through your host organism. These pathogenic parasitic fungi have a wide variety of chemical mechanisms for acquiring nutrients, and each mechanism has been shaped by evolution to optimize for the parasitism of their particular host. Sometimes you'll have a species that can be infected by more than one kind of fungal parasite, and each fungal species has its own mechanism for infecting and stealing nutrients from its host. For example, there are no less than six fungal species that can infect humans, and they each have specialized means for infecting and spreading within their human host. There's a species of yeast fungus, typically found in bird feces, called Cryptococcus neoformans. This C. neoformin species can infect a variety of plants and animals, including humans, where it will typically infect the lungs. Here's what happens in the course of this C. neoformans infection in humans. The spores are inhaled into the lungs, into the pulmonary tract, where they then come into contact with the macrophages of the immune system. These macrophages will put up a doomed fight to ward off the fungal invader with oxidative and nitrosative chemicals, and these will kill some of the fungal particles, but not all of them. The surviving C. neoformin cells will get eaten by the macrophages, but because these fungal cells produce a protective capsule coating, instead of getting dissolved within the macrophage, they will survive within the immune cells, and there they lay dormant. After being absorbed into the macrophages of the lungs, the fungal particles will necessarily go where the macrophages go. They can spread from the lungs into the blood, and even pass through the blood-brain barrier of the central nervous system to infect the brain and the spinal cord. Here, once inside the central nervous system, the C. neoformans feeds off of the glucose and ion nutrients in the blood and the brain and can cause serious diseases like meningoencephalitis and brain abscesses called cryptococomas. Basically, by getting into the bloodstream and infecting the central nervous system, the fungi can easily absorb everything that it needs to survive. It has all of its nutrients available. It absorbs its food directly out of the host's bloodstream, parasitizing nutrients in the most intimate way possible. Many of the most notoriously brutal parasitic fungi species come from the Ascomycete genus Cordyceps, which typically infects arthropods like insects. These fungi have a horrible and violent means of extracting nutrients from their host. Their spores get consumed or absorbed by the insect, or the hyphae of a pre-existing fungal individual can latch onto the exoskeleton and penetrate it reaching the soft guts inside. Once the fungus has penetrated the exoskeleton, the mycelium grows deep inside the insect's body. As it grows and spreads, it literally feeds off of the tissues of its host, eating its guts from the inside out. Some of these species, like the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, induce a zombie-like state in their hosts by hijacking their bodies, changing their behavior, controlling their gene expression, and even steering them like a flesh vehicle. The fungus steers the insect's body to a place and position advantageous for the spread of the fungus's spores. These spores then go on to infect more insects, and the fungus spreads. I'll talk about this phenomenon in much more gruesome, visceral detail in the upcoming episode on fungal reproduction, as this mechanism of infection is ultimately used to help the fungus reproduce and spread its spores. The insect host itself provides the gooey organic food for the fungus to eat, and its body becomes a literal biological vehicle for the fungus to steer around into an optimal position.
The Armillaria genus of honey fungus are known for their parasitism of trees, which leads to widespread tree death and the destruction of forests. The Armillaria fungi use their rhizomorphs to come into contact with and then penetrate the roots of trees. The fungus typically goes for smaller, younger roots because they're relatively soft, or roots near the trunk of the tree where it can access the full load of nutrients being absorbed from the soil. The rhizomorphs grow in and under the bark, followed by the spread of white mycelia, which then interfere with the vascular system of the host tree to steal its nutrients. Sometimes the armillaria kills the tree quickly. Other times, typically with larger, older trees with huge root systems, it'll take a little longer for the host tree to die. If the infection progresses over the course of years, which is entirely possible, the fungus will spread farther and farther throughout its body and steal more and more nutrients, and the tree will experience symptoms of degrading health, like progressively worse and worse leaf growth during every summer, and less overall growth during every growing season. Eventually, after having suffered from infection and relative starvation for months or even years, the tree will die. Now, most parasites, like insect parasites in an animal, for example, will also die if their host dies, so it's in their interest to moderate their parasitism so they get the nutrients they need, but also so they don't outright kill their host. This moderation of their own infection is an issue of life or death for most parasites, and they typically want to avoid committing suicide by proxy. However, fungus, like the armillaria, just doesn't care whether the tree lives or dies. In fact, the fungus probably prefers the tree to die, because the fungus can still consume the dead tree's biomass through saprophytic metabolism. This is, in my opinion, one of the cooler ways that organisms on Earth have evolved for getting their nutrients. Saprophytic or saprotrophic organisms are those that engage in extracellular digestion, or external digestion. Typically, the saprophytic organism will find dead and decaying organic material, and after growing on it and permeating through it, the hyphae will release digestive chemicals that break down the detritus and turn it into a soft chemical mush, which is really easy for the fungus to absorb. In some cases, an organism may be stressed by a harsh environment, or by a, some random disease, or a mechanical injury. And maybe through these factors, or through old age, the organism is dying. It's not dead yet, but it's dying. In this case, the fungi engage in what's called facultative saprotrophism, where they will infect the dying organism and speed up the process to bring it to death. They'll infect their host and begin secreting these digestive chemicals right away, which serves to accelerate the host's suffering until it just outright dies. When that finally happens, the fungus is no longer slowed down or hampered by the host's immune system, and the saprophytic digestion really begins to accelerate. The armillaria honey fungus that I just talked about is one such facultative saprophyte. It infects trees through their roots, typically trees that are already stressed or in the process of dying, and the armillaria pushes them along with compounding infections and parasitism until the tree finally dies. Then, the tree's entire body becomes fair game for the fungus to consume. The fungus can take years to fully digest a dead adult tree, which yields an absolutely tremendous amount of nutrients. As the armillaria, or any other facultative saprophytic fungus for that matter, digests its most recent kill, it now has a home base of nutrients that allows it to spread out and explore for more hosts to infect and kill, or for more detritus to consume. The nutrients from the original host, from the rotting tree, supports the fungus's growth as it sets up lethal attacks on other trees. And in this way, it has the potential to wipe out entire forests, in a seemingly unstoppable wave of mycelial expansion. Okay, so let's explore this technique of saprophytic digestion in greater detail. First, 
First, there has to be a specific condition, or set of conditions, for a saprophyte to effectively break down detritus and absorb the product nutrients. As I explained earlier, the fungus is 90% water, so it needs a steady supply of water. The fungus is overwhelmingly composed of water by mass, and so water is necessary to keep it healthy enough to engage in metabolic activity. Water is also a necessary ingredient in some of the chemical reactions involved in digestion. Without water, without sufficient water, those reactions can't take place. It's kind of like how photosynthesis in plants requires water. And among all of these chemical processes that uh, powers photosynthesis, you have the one that splits water into hydrogen ions and molecular oxygen. Without water, a plant can't conduct photosynthesis, and its carbon synthesis grinds to a halt. The same goes for fungi and their carbon-acquiring equivalent. Furthermore, the digestive enzymes secreted by the fungi require an external aqueous solution in order for them to dissolve and disperse across the substrate. They need a water solution, like blood or phloem, to help float around the digestive enzymes so that they can get into contact with and break down as much of the biological substrate as possible. Without this solution, the digestive enzymes won't get very far. They might end up coating the fungus itself, which is counterproductive and possibly damaging. Also, the environment has to be right. The temperature has to be suitable for fungal metabolism. If it's too cold, the fungus will be unable to effectively engage in the metabolic processes that are necessary to break down detritus. The energy balance will be all out of whack, and the requisite chemical reactions won't work. The coldest temperature that saprophytic fungi can tolerate is around 1 degree Celsius, or 33 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just barely above the freezing point of water. Now, on the other hand, if it's too hot, the necessary enzymes will also be unable to function. Perhaps the enzymes can't become activated at higher temperatures, or perhaps they denature and become useless. Whatever the case, saprophytic digestion typically doesn't work at temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius, or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. There have been studies that have shown that the optimal temperature for saprophytic fungi to absorb nutrients, and to use those nutrients to grow their tissues and to heal themselves, is on the warmer end of this range, around 25 degrees Celsius, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit which is about as warm as a typical summer day in the mid-range and higher latitudes. Furthermore, to optimally engage in saprophytic digestion, the fungi needs to exist in soil that's either neutral or very slightly acidic. So the soils that you'd find in a boreal forest or a peat bog in the northern taiga will tend to be way more acidic than your average saprophyte can handle. And one last point is that saprophytic digestion is an aerobic process, which means that it requires oxygen. The vast majority of saprophytic fungi find it very challenging to digest detritus in anaerobic conditions, like what you would find in a wet clay soil, or a swamp saturated with, with murky high saline water, or really within any kind of body of water, like a lake or a river. Sometimes, even dry soil doesn't have enough oxygen to support saprotrophism, so the fungi's metabolic activity is restricted to wet detritus littering the ground. I use the word restricted, but this really isn't much of a restriction, because in practice, in the real world, when a plant or an animal dies, its body almost always ends up resting on the surface of the soil, where it's exposed to air and its body, by dint of being a, a living or a once-living organism, its body is moist and it's full of water, and it has a biologically tolerable pH. So when you see any dead thing lying around on the surface of the ground, chances are it's already infected with some kind of fungus that's eating it from the inside out. So really, it's not much of a restriction, because anywhere something dies, potentially a fungus can eat it. So, these are the conditions necessary for the fungi to break down detritus into bioavailable food. 
The next topic is then how the specific biochemicals in the detritus get broken down and metabolized. Just like the plants and animals, the fungi require proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates. However, many of these molecules are far too large to simply be absorbed through the hyphae membranes, so the fungus has to first break them down into smaller chunks or pieces, and then absorb the smaller, more bioaccessible or more usable component chemicals. Then they'll utilize their own enzymes and internal biochemistry to reconstitute these chemical components into the fully formed proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates that the fungus needs to maintain its tissues and to grow. The metabolic enzymes themselves are expressed in groups, where the whole group is necessary to fully absorb a particular compound, like a certain lipid or protein from a specific host. Because the excreted enzymatic fluid is a thorough mix of all of these necessary enzymes, they can all participate to fully metabolize a given compound. As I'm going through this and explaining the details, try to remember the high surface area of the mycelia due to all of its little hyphae creeping into the substrate. This high surface area is how they're also so effective at absorbing all of the nutrients that they're able to dissolve out of the substrate. To my surprise and frustration, finding the information on how fungal enzymes break down various macromolecules was kind of challenging. A lot of the in-depth chemical details are simply not well understood, as there are few studies that have peered so deeply at the specific processes. But with that said, it is known that cellulases break apart carbohydrates like cellulase, that peroxidases degrade lignin, and that pectinases are used to degrade and decay softer tissue like fruits. These are the enzymes involved in your typical plant digestion. The fungi has to be able to break apart plant polymers. Dead animals are also a rich source of food for fungi. However, because the animal cells lack cell walls, their bodies decay relatively rapidly. As far as the fungus is concerned, animal carcass is a tasty but ephemeral treat. To break apart the fats, or the lipids, in the animal's body, the fungi secretes enzymes called lipases. These lipases consume a water molecule through a hydrolysis reaction to catalyze the breakdown of lipids. They do this by snipping a specific region of the lipid, like breaking up a triglyceride into its constituent monoglycerides or breaking open the aromatic rings in a steroid to crack it apart into smaller, more manageable pieces. To break down the proteins that are so heavily concentrated in animal tissues, fungi express enzymes called proteases. These also consume a water molecule in a hydrolysis reaction, using it to break apart the peptide bonds between amino acids. These peptide bonds hold the amino acids together in a chain, in a complete protein, so breaking them will cut up the protein into smaller chunks. Keep in mind that there's an impossibly huge variety of proteins, but these proteases are very clever. The chemists called them promiscuous, but all that that means is that these little enzymes have one or some main functions, and their promiscuity means they can also engage in a wide range of side reactions. These side reactions are usually slower, and in living organisms, less vital. In living organisms, the secondary functions of some particular enzyme might be nice, you know, might have some supportive role, but they're often much less important to the living organism than that enzyme's main function, whatever that happens to be. But to the fungi, what this protease promiscuity means is that its digestive enzymes are doing their main function, which is to break down certain proteins, as well as lots of secondary reactions, which are like little bits of extra work breaking stuff up. This is really good for the fungus, because that enzymatic promiscuity adds up. When you express millions of these enzymes, all of their little side reactions accumulate into a non-trivial portion of the total digestive activity. Ultimately, it helps the fungi speed up the breakdown of their food, which can yield more absorbable nutrients in a shorter time span. 
That has an obvious advantage when the animal carcass will be largely scavenged to the bone and decayed within just a few weeks or months. Now, speaking of carbohydrates, perhaps the most common carbohydrate that a fungus runs into is cellulose. Cellulose is by far and away the most abundant biopolymer on Earth, as it's present in the cells of literally every plant and most algae. Cellulose is a biopolymer composed of monomers of glucose. To first break down the cellulose polymer, the fungi expresses agents called cellulase. These cellulases will then go in and consume a water molecule in a hydrolysis reaction to break apart some point in the polymer, or I should say, some specific type of chemical bond within the polymer. The water molecule gets split apart and used to cap the ends of the smaller polymers created by the split. For the cellulose to be fully broken apart, it requires different kinds of cellulases, each of them targeting a specific bond or configuration within the polymer. For example, the fungus Trichoderma ricei expresses no less than seven types of cellulases, one of which cuts up the cellulose polymer into small, two-monomer chunks called dimers, or more specific to cellulose, it's called cellubios. The total activity of all of the expressed digestive enzymes breaks down the cellulose into its constituent monomers, into many little molecules of glucose. The free-floating glucose molecules are then easy prey. For the fungus, the raw glucose is very easy to absorb, and it's easy to metabolize to extract the chemical energy. The lignin that's found in wood is one of the most abundant types of biopolymer on the planet, second only to cellulose. The vast forests that carpet much of the terrestrial landscape are covered in billions and billions of tons of wood. Wood is dense and heavy. It's packed with carbon and other key nutrients. And because of the cellulose cell walls and the lignin that gives wood its strength, every cubic meter of wood contains a relatively high amount of chemical energy. The lignin that gives wood its strength is a polymer composed of three different monomers, each linking together in random order. Specifically, there's the paracumeral alcohol, with two alcohol groups and an aromatic ring. There's the coniferal alcohol, with a similar base structure but also a single methoxy group. And then cinnabol alcohol, again with the same base structure but with two methoxy groups. Paracumeral alcohol is typical of lignin in grass species while the lignin in Norway spruce trees is apparently close to 100% coniferal alcohol. Anyway, when lignin was first evolved sometime in the early Carboniferous period, there were no organisms that could digest it. No species had the enzymes necessary to take it apart and capture the chemical energy for itself. That was until bacteria and fungi evolved the means to do it in the range of some 300 million years ago. The fungi evolved a group of peroxidase enzymes as the primary decomposers of lignin, with support enzymes called lacases that further break down the resulting chunks, or smaller lignin polymers and monomers. Other fungal enzymes help to produce H2O2, or hydrogen peroxide, which itself is necessary for the function of the peroxidase enzymes. For example, the heme peroxidases have an iron atom that reacts with hydrogen peroxide to produce an intermediary chemical that ultimately oxidizes the lignin. Another example, found in species of white rot fungus, is that they'll release a chemical called veritril alcohol, which is an upregulating metabolite that helps lignin peroxidase break down lignin. Now, I could go on into a lot of technical detail here, but it would get boring very quickly, and it would amount to little more than an exercise in pronouncing chemical names. So rather than doing that, let me try to express just how crazy important this evolved ability of the fungi really is. The capacity to break down lignin had global consequences. So recall that the ability to break down lignin emerged during the Carboniferous period, 
a brief stretch of time after lignin was itself evolved in plants. Within that brief stretch of time, where lignin had evolved and was existing, but before something was evolved to break it down, entire forests worth of trees were growing and dying and their bodies stacking up on each other to go through the ages without rotting. That's what happens when nothing can chemically decompose something. It will stay around for a while. Entire forests worth of trees were fossilized, which makes the Carboniferous a period rich in paleontological and evolutionary data. Here's the key takeaway. If these ancient Carboniferous forests, be they tropical jungle or boreal taiga, if they had continued to accumulate, a huge chunk of the carbon currently cycled through the world's biosphere would instead be locked up in coal deposits, buried deep underground. Much of the coal that we mine today came from the Carboniferous period, so these coal deposits would naturally be a lot larger if the fungi and bacteria took an extra 100 million years to evolve the ability to break down lignin. The ecological side effect was that, by breaking down all of this lignin, the fungi returned that carbon to the carbon cycle, where it could be absorbed by plants and eaten by animals. If the fungi did this millions of years later, or not at all, the consequence would be a world without enough raw carbon to sustain the dense vegetation and animal life that we see today. And on top of this, if the plants kept extracting CO2 from the atmosphere and there was no fungi or bacteria to decompose the dead plants and return that carbon to the atmosphere, then this, this gradual extraction of CO2 would cause the planet's global temperature to drop. The plants are removing this greenhouse gas from the atmosphere, and if there was nothing to replenish it, the Earth could have been thrown into a snowball phase and frozen over forever. This is perhaps the most ancient and most fundamental way in which fungi have modified the world to make it more suitable for life. There are countless other ways that fungi modify the world, altering ecosystems and engaging in symbiotic behavior that promotes life where it would otherwise struggle. These symbiotic relationships between fungi and other living things play a defining role in fungal ecology which I'll be exploring in more detail in the last episode of this series. You might have noticed that I've largely ignored mycorrhizal fungi in this episode, even though the method of their nutrition is really cool, and it's, it's ecologically, it's really important. However, the mycorrhizal fungi engage in one of the most important symbiotic relationships in the world, so I figured that it would be better to save that for the last episode on the symbiotic relationships that fungi have evolved and their ecological ramification. It's better suited for that episode than for this one, even though this is the episode on fungal nutrition. If you're enjoying this, if you're enjoying learning about the world of fungi, then get ready for stuff to get really crazy. Because when it comes to symbiotically interacting with other organisms, nothing is as diverse, or as widespread, or as important as the fungi. And as always, thanks for listening.